years ago. The point is, the DNA is stable. There are no proteins left from that animal, but the DNA is left behind. So the point is, DNA becomes a hereditary material because DNA has the ability to be stable and not, not wear itself out, and that's what allows it to be the hereditary material. So the conclusion of science, and this is a conventional view as we're speaking right here. This is what's being taught in schools, and everyone hears the story. It's called the primacy of DNA. And what does it mean? It says, I told you, you are protein. You're protein. Where does your protein come from? Ah, well, it comes from the DNA because that's the blueprint. And the DNA makes a Xerox copy of itself, which is called RNA, and the Xerox copy goes into the cell, and the blueprint, the RNA blueprint, is read and converted into the protein. So the bottom line is this. Here's a simple understanding. If your character is in your protein, where'd your protein come from? It came from the DNA. So therefore, your character is apparently determined by the DNA. So our belief in the primacy of DNA says this. Who you are, what you are, is predetermined in the blueprint, the DNA. So you become a readout of the DNA. So when you read articles like this in Life magazine that says, were you born this way? Now we start to recognize not only is our physical structure apparently determined by our DNA, but so is our behavior, aggression, anxiety, happiness, alcoholism, obesity. All these kinds of things are now attributed to what? Some pattern that you have received. So if you start to feel ill at some point, and then they start to say, well, God, that, you know, you have genes that are affecting you in this. And so the point about it is ultimately what is the belief system? The belief system is if I can understand all the genes and then I could replace any broken genes that you have and I could replace your health. It's a nice, noble concept and led to the Human Genome Project. But the conclusion of this is what? This paper just occurred, this was only uh, back in uh, May in science, it's a mainstream journal, and it's about the nucleus, the cell, and the nucleus is a, an organelle inside the cell where the DNA is. And I bring this up because it, it, it says exactly what the conventional point of view is. It says the nucleus is the command center of the cell. What does it mean, command center of the cell? Well, what we were looking for was the brain of the cell. As I said, every cell has all the same functions that you have. Well, you have organs to carry out your functions. Inside a cell, there are miniature organs, and they're called organelles. And I said, since you have all of your functions are in a cell, then a cell has a nervous system. The nervous system is the command center. The nervous system is now going to be the nucleus of the cell, that dark red structure. For what reason? Because conventional biology said that the nucleus is the command center of the cell. So what does that mean? Well, that's where all the genes are. All the genes are in the nucleus, and since the genes control who you are, then the nucleus, as a repository of all the genes, would represent the source of control. And therefore, it leads us to the conclusion that the equivalent of the brain is the nucleus. Does that so far make any sense of what I'm talking about? Okay, now listen to this. This is where it all falls apart. Listen to the simple logic question. If I take the brain out of any living organism, there's an immediate and necessary consequence of that action. What is it? Death. And here's the point. You can take the nucleus out of the cell, and the cell doesn't die. The cell can live for two or more months without any genes in it at all. It's not sitting there. It's moving around. It's eating. It's growing. It's meeting other cells and communicating with them. It recognizes toxins and avoids toxins. In other words, I did not change the behavior in one way, not so ever, by taking out all the genes. What does that mean? Think of the logic of what, what does the logic mean? Can the genes control, can be the brain of the cell, yes or no? Yeah. Ah, well, that's the important part because this is understanding of enucleation, the process of removing the nucleus. It's, it's done a lot at higher levels of biology, and those people who do it obviously know the genes aren't controlling the cell, but somewhere along the line, all of you have heard through all the news media, of course, the genes control the cell. So the bottom line is, assumption number two, genes control biological expression is false. But then that leaves us with the important question. If the genes aren't controlling the cell, what is controlling the cell? And this is where my research led me about in 1985 to understand the relationship that genes have with the cell. And the important part is this. In the literature, especially in mass media, these two words get confused all the time, correlation and causation. Correlation means associated with some, there's a connection between things. Genes are correlated with your body. That's a fact. Causation is the act or agency that produces an effect. 
Genes do not cause anything. That's the error. But the problem is this. You read an article, and this is a true story. An article that reveals, for example, that they found a gene correlated with obesity. And then, here's what was interesting about it. They went to a, a number of expected parents who were expecting a child, and they said, listen, if we would do amniocentesis and check the cells of your fetus and found that your fetus had this gene associated with obesity, what would you do? 70% of the parents said they would immediately opt for an abortion. And the relevance about that is, I never said the genes caused obesity. They're correlated with obesity. The fact is, if you read the articles, they always start out, a new gene is correlated with cancer. And then about a paragraph down the road, this gene causes cancer. This is an error. Genes do not cause anything. Genes are potential. Whether you activate the genes or not is not at the behest of the gene. So what is it that selects the genes? And the answer is, well, we start off with the, the, the first part about this is, what are the genes, what activates the genes? Because if I knew what activated the genes, then I'd be right at the edge of what's controlling the genes. I use this paper because there's a, a sentence I use straight out of the paper, so I'm not trying to pull any wool over your eyes. This paper, Metaphors in the Role of Genes in Development, explains this. Metaphors means, in this case of science, when a scientist wants to do an experiment, he creates a hypothesis. This is an idea. The experiment is to test the idea. The hypothesis is not a truth, it's just a suggestion. In 1953, when Watson and Crick found the secret of the DNA code, the hypothesis was made that genes control biology. But that was in 1953. That was 50 years ago. And the issue is this. If you keep repeating that over and over again, at some point, you forget that it was a hypothesis. At some point, it becomes a truth. And so we buy the truth that it's in major textbooks everywhere. Genes control. Genes control. And the answer is, do genes control? This paper reveals in this sentence by Niehau the truth. When a gene product is needed, a signal from its environment, not an emergent property of the gene itself, activates expression of that gene. Well, the third line, not an emergent property of the gene itself, means this. Genes are blueprints. A blueprint is not on or off. A blueprint is just data. Can, if you had a blueprint to a house, does, is there an on and off to your blueprint? No. The blueprint doesn't go on and off, but what goes on and off is who's reading the blueprint. And the point is, genes are blueprints, but they don't determine if they're going to be read or not. And when it says, where, what makes it read? The answer is a signal from its environment. Well, let me explain exactly how genes work. This is a picture of a nucleus of a cell that's isolated. That's where all the chromosomes are. Then there's a broken nucleus from the same preparation, and you can see all the chromosomes are lined up out there. And you can see, for example, the two red ones. And the point about it is this. You get two sets of chromosomes, one from your mother that comes with the egg, and one set of chromosomes from your father that comes with the sperm. So you actually have two complete sets of programs to make a human being in every cell in your body. And the issue about why I'm showing you this slide is because it's new interesting technique for staining the chromosomes. And the fact is, what am I staining? Well, the belief system is the nucleus contains the DNA, which it does. But here's the point. I'm not staining DNA. I'm staining protein. 50% of the nucleus is protein. But we don't talk about the protein. Why not? Because we're so focused on the DNA. When they do the experiments, what do they do? They break open the nucleus like this. They isolate the chromosomes. Then they throw away the proteins and study the pure DNA. But the truth is, there is no such thing as pure DNA in a human system. What does it look like in the system? And the answer looks like this. What are the proteins actually looking like? And, and right here, what you can see is this. The proteins are covering the outside of the DNA like a sleeve. These proteins are given a name of regulatory proteins, a great name because that's their function. How do they work? And it's so simple, it works like this. Imagine my arm as DNA. Well, let's imagine my bare arm as DNA. And I write a genetic code. Let's say I write the code for blue eyes on my arm, the genes that make the, the code for blue eyes. And I say, okay, what does this DNA look like when I put it back in the nucleus? And the answer is it looks like this. Can you read the genes or not? What do you have to do to read the genes? Say it. Take the sleeve off. Then you can read the gene, because the code is written on the arm. So what's the sleeve? The sleeve is the protein. Well, how does a protein come on and off? And the answer is this. Here's a protein. 
that is covering my DNA, and I change the signal by removing a signal or adding a signal, and what does a protein do? Change its shape, and when it changes its shape, it pulls away from the DNA. And the moment it pulls away from the DNA, I have bare DNA, now I can read it. So the question is this, in order to read the genes of the cell, then what I have to do is affect the protein. So let's look at the flow chart now. Here's the current version of the flow chart. Remember before it was DNA, RNA, and protein, the conventional one that's in all the textbooks? And the answer is, well, that's incorrect. It's totally incorrect. For the answer is, the DNA is covered by regulatory proteins. And to, to get the regulatory proteins off, the sleeve off so I can read the gene, I need an environmental signal. So the bottom line is this. You're not controlled by DNA. You're controlled by environmental signals. And this is what Niehaut writes in his paper. Just reading the yellow lines is the answer. You are not controlled by genes before it's a signal from its environment that activates the expression of the gene. So all of a sudden it says, wait a minute, then I'm not, I'm not genetically determined? No, you're environmentally determined. And all of a sudden, so what's, you know, we have to talk about how does that happen? Let me explain the mechanism. First of all, what is the environment? Well, the environment, there are two environments that affect all of us. There's an internal environment under your skin, the environment of your physiology, your blood composition, the temperature of your body, the amount of sugar in your body, the amount of nutrients available, the information. This is the environment on the inside. Yet, what is the other environment? The environment on the outside controls us. Why? Because when we live in that environment, we have to adjust ourselves to what's ever happening. And to adjust ourselves, then we change our genes to adjust to the environmental signals because the environmental signals elicit the gene action. So the question is, so where's the brain of the cell? And the answer is, the brain of the cell is the membrane. It is the skin of the cell. What about our belief that the, the brain of the cell was the nucleus? And the answer is this. Science is a male-dominated profession. And since males think with this, they made the brain of the cell. But the bottom line, I'll tell you what the nucleus is. The nucleus is the gonad of the cell. Why? What is the function of the nucleus? To make the programs and blueprints to replace the parts. So when I need new parts, I go to the gonad to give me reproduction. So the nucleus is for reproduction, it's not for brain. The brain of the cell is the membrane, and I don't have a lot of time to go into exactly why, but you have to understand that the membrane is the most primitive structure in biology. The most primitive organisms have just a single membrane. They don't have anything else in that, and that all their functions come from the membrane. So if we understand the membrane, we can then understand how it works. So let me illustrate, for example, how it works. Here are cells on the surface of a culture dish, and if I look at the membrane and I cut into the surface of the cell, this is what we see. That the surface of the cell looks like this layered structure right here that separates the outside environment from the inside environment. The yellow in the middle is like oil. And as a result, the membrane is a barrier that separates the outside from the inside because water can't go through the middle of the membrane and carry information across. So the self on the inside, under the membrane, is separated from the environment on the outside. But this wouldn't do any functions. This is just protection. To do function, I need the protein that does movement. Proteins do the movement. Proteins do the function. So like I showed you in my poppet bead version of the proteins, that these poppet beads insert themselves into that membrane structure that I showed you. And so the proteins stick inside the membrane. There are two classes of proteins in the membrane. They're very important. One set is called receptors. What's a receptor? Do you have receptors? Of course you do. What Name some. Skin, what, name some other ones that people are pretty obvious about. Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. Where are all the receptors located? In your skin. And the same with the cell. But in the cell, they're not organized into these structures that we see, but the proteins have antennas on them. And each different thing the cell can see has a different protein with a different antenna. So for insulin, I have a receptor that sees insulin. For glucose, I have a receptor that sees glucose. For light, I have a receptor that responds to photons of light. So for everything the cell can see, there's a special receptor inside the cell. And then 
the receptor is for what? Taking signals in. That's what receptors do. I see through my receptors. But now when the signals come in, I have to make a behavior to respond to the signal. So that's the other set of proteins. The example that I'm going to use from the other set is called a channel. A channel means a canal. And the point about it is, in the resting state, the channel is closed. Nothing can go through the channel. But in an activated state, the channel opens up and there's a tunnel that goes from one side of the membrane to the other.